Welcome to this evening's lecture. It's the last event in our program, Brave New World. People is about to introduce Rowan Moore, our speaker this evening, who's architecture critic for The Observer, and we're delighted to have him here. Finally, I think we've tried a few times to have you here. And I think I'm one of many who looks forward to Rowan's Sunday column every weekend. Over the last year, we've been exploring the changing role of the architect and questioning whether younger designers are driven by a renewed social consciousness and more utopian ideal of what can be done by design. And it'd be interesting to hear Rowan's views and indeed people's comments, who's not completely convinced by this. <laughs> our architecture program would not be possible without our sponsors, who are Alford Hall, Monning and Morris, Bennett's Associates, Marcus Trust, Eric Parry Architects, John S. Cohn Foundation, Brian Guinness Charitable Trust, and Jamie Fobert Architects. So is there anyone here who doesn't know people? Chora. <laughs> people is <laughs> professor at the School of Architecture and Design at the University of Camerino and senior architecture critic at the Maxi. Please welcome people. Yeah. Uh, very, very briefly, in 1981, I got my first article accepted on Il Manifesto. This, this made me, ex I was still a student, this made me extremely proud because I was going to be published on the most snob, leftist, uh, authoritative, intellectual newspaper in the country. And I was happy because I was writing on, on that newspaper. I, was not, I didn't understand I was doing something for architecture. I, I thought I was doing something for my political commitment and for my desire to belong to this intellectual elite that the, that the newspaper was representing. But of course, later when I started to enter the architecture world, so I, decided, so I thought maybe I can be an architecture critic. Then I started to move towards Milano and Venice and did my PhD in Venice and understood that the word critic was forbidden in Italy, that Tafuri would, it was considered an insult among the architecture historians in this country and you could never, never, never say you were a critic. You could do some criticism, just hiding it somewhere in the, so, so this was, we always had this very strange relationship with this idea of architecture criticism. There were no architect, there was no architectural newspapers when I, did my first articles in the early 80s. There were some friends of Gregotti sometimes publishing something about Gregotti or against Portoghese. This was the only articles that would go on Repubblica or Corriere della Sera. And so this, this was the funny geography of this thing. So I'm very happy to introduce Rowan because he could do what I couldn't do, not to be an architecture critic for his life and, and, and dedicate to this. Uh, I'm very happy to say that he's a trained architect. He studied architecture in, in Cambridge. Uh, he practiced also for a while, so he knows what architecture he is, so he knows what he's talking about. Uh, but then he committed, as we said, to journalism. Now, as whether, uh, why for us it was impossible to consider us as journalists. Even if we were journalists, we were like ar writing architects, not really journalists. Uh, Rowan took part in many super interesting experiences, like Blueprint. Blueprint is a wonderful magazine we all, really, we, we all love and we all liked for a long time and still coming out. Then he started to work for, for newspapers, the Evening Standard, the, the Guardian, which is still giving a lot of space to architecture in, this, in these days. Uh, and then he was also a director of the Architecture Foundation, an important institution in this attempt to connect architecture and society and, 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 and the city and the society in, in UK. Um, I think then from, from the, the late the tens, uh, he writes on The Observer. It's a like full-scale, full-time architecture critic. He had many prizes. He was the critic of the year in 2014. Uh, he, I think I've been following some of his writing recently and also we've been some kind of fragmented discussion and it's fo focusing a lot on the issues architects are supposed to be taking on in our days, which is the ecological crisis, which is the political 
and social issues that are coming with the cities and with the communities in our days. So I think it's the one that the perfect person to perfect fellow to speak about what architects are trying to do and maybe managing to do, or maybe they would like to do in the contemporary society. Uh, Rowan has published uh, many books. The most important, I think, are the uh, uh, Why We Build, which is a very good question for today, probably. Uh, the Slow Burn City, and also the Anatomy of a Building, which is a series, I think, of books that focus on a building. I think I uh, thank, thanks Marina for, we're now happy that finally Marina introduces personally this, this lecture. It took only like 12 years to do this. Uh, thank Rowan and thank everybody to be here. I, 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 I welcome Rowan on the stage and then I welcome also all the questions and discussion we will want, you will, will be wanting to, to raise at the end of this talk. Grazie. Um, well, it's wonderful to be here in Rome, Italy, in a country with very calm and rational politics compared with where I'm from. Um, and so, as, as we've heard, this lecture is about um, millennial architecture as a, as a sort of summary of the, of the series um, that Marina has organized here. And um, a long time ago, when Marina asked me to give this lecture, I thought of this title, um, and then I sort of forgot about why I gave it this title. And talking to Marta today, who was interviewing me, I, um, I remembered. Um, it is, of course, a reference to um, the famous painting by Richard Hamilton, Uh, sorry, painting, collage, I should say. Um, just what is it about today's, uh, that makes today's homes uh, so different, so appealing? And it was the um, frontispiece of the This Is Tomorrow exhibition in the Whitechapel Art Gallery in 1956. And that was really a kind of coming out party of artists and architects who were well, might have been called millennial in those days, except the word hadn't been invented and didn't apply for chronological reasons. But it was the sort of the coming generation of, of architects and artists. So you had Richard Hamilton, Paolozzi, uh, you had Peter and Alison Smithson. And there was a kind of confidence both that artists and architects could work meaningfully together and that actually they could also contribute something to society and they could actually make the future which is an idea that keeps coming back, but with greater or lesser kind of conviction and hopefulness. So millennials, are these people called millennials? Um, one of those labels that gets applied every sort of 15 or 20 years ago to um, uh, the next group of people who are, who are coming along. And this is from um, Wikipedia, because why not? Uh, so, there's this idea that millennials are kind of never quite grow up. They're the Peter Pan generation. There's um, sometimes a feeling millennials are a bit spoiled, a bit self-obsessed. I don't really think that's true. I think there is a sense in which they are, they don't grow up, but that's partly because they're not allowed to, um, at least in architecture, and that's one of the things I'm going to be talking about. But I find the millennial generation of architects more concerned with making some positive, constructive difference to society than any generation of architects that I've known in the 40 years since I went to architecture school. Um, it's been through many, the study of architecture has been through many sort of revolutions or at least uh, turning of circles in that time. Um, but I think it's a particular feature of now that architects are really desperate to be useful and not just decorative. Um, this is Assemble 
who are probably the sort of definitive millennial architects in London at the moment. This is the project that launched them, which I expect a lot of you are familiar with. Um, and it came out of the, the credit crunch, the recession, a time when uh, very little was being built. There seemed to be kind of very little prospect of architects even getting near a building. Um, that feeling hasn't entirely gone away, but it was, it was more severe then. And it's kind of a question of what can you do, how can you make an impression uh, with a kind of minimum of resources, uh, except for human resources. And it's an old gas station that was made into a uh, cinema by this group of, most of whom were students, so I don't think any of them were qualified architects. And they just put their own ingenuity and their own sweated labor into this project. Um, it was also a, a sort of, it's hard to think now, it's actually the dawn of pop-ups. Um, it was when the idea of a pop-up seemed like an exciting new thing. And of course, the pop-up became very rapidly a sort of commercialized concept that people wanting to sell fizzy drinks or um, whatever it might be would, would have pop-up shops or perfumes or something. But it was actually a kind of an interesting novel thing to do at this moment. And it's a very charming, very lovely project which activated the street, had a kind of public aspect to it. And the big idea essentially is that the, that curtain that you see came down for the purposes of um, watching a performance, for watching a screening, and then it came up at the end, revealing the audience to the street. Um, so that the audience was sort of part of the spectacle, part of the performance. So that was a very nice thing. Um, but very small, of course, and very cheap. This is another, in a way, millennial event, um, although it was based on an architect who was not millennial, uh, Neve Brown. And he died shortly after this, this event. And he was a great architect of social housing in London. Um, and he, a talk was given by him, organized by the Architecture Foundation at the Hackney Empire, which is a big old theater in London with a 1,300 seats. And he filled the space with mostly millennial architects. And he got a standing ovation at the end, which is something I've never seen before, I don't think. You can give me a standing ovation if you like, but I don't think you will. Um, and in fact, a few years before that, I got Neve Brown to talk at another event at the Architecture Foundation, and the venue only held like 100, and that's what we got, because he, he didn't seem like such an important figure. So in a few years, he became someone who could fill a theater like this and get a standing ovation. And the reason for this is because he was an architect of housing. And he worked for the London Borough of Camden in the 1960s and 70s, building social housing, designing social housing. And right at the end of that period when it was felt that architects could be entrusted with large-scale social housing and where architectural ideas could be applied to this sort of huge large-scale public purpose. And his most famous building is this, um, the Alexandra Road Estate in London, finished in the late 70s with a great deal of effort and struggle and all sorts of problems. And it was very much celebrated by architects it had a fairly familiar story of not being completely successful um, after it was built, um, some people not liking it, there being problems with crime, which may or may not be attributable to the architecture. Um, but then in the course of time, people began to appreciate it and love it. And for an architect now to look at that, that's just wonderful, that's to think 
that an architect could be entrusted with such an important thing and to be allowed to really apply architectural ideas to it. And it's a very long way from what is actually possible for millennial architects now. So the condition of the millennial architect in London at the moment and probably elsewhere is that they have immense aspiration, they have talent, ambition, energy, like every new generation always has, but there is a kind of mismatch between the aspiration and the ability to put it into practice. And that's really the kind of theme of what I'm going to talk about. It's also significant because there is a what's called a housing crisis in London. There's severe issues of affordability, access to housing, architects, young architects as badly paid young professionals experience this quite intensely in their personal lives. So that's another reason why they care a lot about housing. Um, so what we have, what we have instead of uh, large scale, innovative, radical housing projects by young architects is pavilions. There's a kind of mania for building pavilions, uh, temporary structures. It sort of started with a serpentine pavilion, the Serpentine Gallery in London, which started this about um, nearly 20 years ago. And the idea was to get architects like Zaha Hadid, Graham Coolhouse, um, famous architects around the world who hadn't built much in London to build a little sample of what they could do um, to give Londoners a taste of, of sort of global architecture. And then more recently, that idea has been transferred to getting young up and coming architects to, to do the same thing. So again, the Architecture Foundation um, has for a few years done something called the Anti Pavilion. And there's actually two of the, uh, oops, sorry. There's actually two pavilions here. Um, this is called by, by some people called Pup. Um, and it's a sort of little roof extension to an existing building. And uh, this is an inflatable kind of performance space on a boat that can sail up and down the canal. Um, and have events inside there, and it's like a sort of 1960s dream of inflatable event space. And this is the latest one um, by Make Swift, which is again as a temporary structure that is seen as a kind of as a framework in which you can have events. So it makes a kind of backdrop for talks, performances, um, but then it's an enjoyable object in its own life, right that you can visit uh, and wander around even when nothing is happening. Uh, then another pavilion is Dulwich College Gallery um, Pavilion, of which there have been two. The building itself is a kind of venerable work of Sir John Soane, famous British architect, and sort of slightly in imitation of the Serpentine, they've also been building pavilions, um, but with young architects rather than sort of global stars. Uh, this is by Practical Price Door, working with a designer called Yinka Ilori, who's British of Jamaican, of Nigerian origin, um, and more than anything else, the colours come from him, um, but it's, it was a true collaboration, but uh, their other work is not, it's not as colourful as this. Um, and this is kind of made of reused uh, concrete drain channels. It's made out of quite simple materials. Um, I'm not sure how much there's to say about it architecturally, but it's a, just a strong, well-designed object that's very inventive with the, with the things that it's made of um, and the interaction of the colour and the structure. And it's also worth saying that all these 
pavilions are very keen to be social spaces. They don't want to just be objects you look at. They really want things to happen in them. Um, there's a kind of yearning to be, to be social and sociable um, that's sort of built into the built into the thinking about it. Now these same architects, when it comes to sort of presenting themselves in the real world, or the, let's say, the, the world outside temporary pavilions, become actually rather cautious and timid. Um, so this is Meg Swift who, who did that one of those architecture foundation projects I showed you. And this is their website. And it says, we have completed a number of projects involving the conservation and conversion of historic buildings, which is a very, very neutral, modest way of presenting themselves. It's not what, it's not the way Zaha Hadid sold herself when she was young. It's not the way Ram Kool has sold himself when he was young. Um, it's, Yes, I would say excessively timid. In a way, I, res it's, I respect that, not to be sort of too rhetorical, too, um, too sort of vainglorious. But on the other hand, you think, well, maybe you could push a little harder. And similarly, Price Gore, who did the, um, the Dulwich Pavilion Gallery that I just showed you, Dulwich Gallery Pavilion that I just showed you, this is a snap from their, a screenshot from their website, and this is very, very careful stuff about just how much white paint and just how much exposed concrete do you put next to each other. And again, I completely respect that work, but it's very striking how careful it is. And here we have someone else. Um, I'm going to think a good thing about London in general and at at present is, is there's always different things happening. It's always diverse. Uh, this is Adam Nathaniel Furman, who was a scholar, a Rome scholar at this school. And he's kind of making a name for himself, sort of shocking everyone with his good, bad taste. Um, he's embracing postmodernism. He's sort of digging up all sorts of architecture, sort of long despised by architects, uh, as I say, for its lack of taste and celebrating it. Um, this is an apartment he did in Japan. Um, so as you see, it's like a finely, very finely calculated uh, sort of balancing of colours that are bordering on the kind of revolting in the way they go together. Um, he also did this, which was an exhibit at the uh, Sir John Soane Museum, and it's kind of inspired by his time in Rome, and it's making little domestic-sized follies, objects, out of fragments of Roman architecture. Uh, inspired by the way that um, John Soane did the same thing at a slightly larger scale. And as I, as I said in the article I wrote about him, he puts the camp into the camp of Marzo. Um, so it's taking the grandest possible architecture and making it playful and domestic. And then he's done this, which is a proposal for a, a sort of town hall for a non-specific location. And this as well. So he's really pushing the boundaries of what might be considered tasteful. Um, he's really using, it's very knowing. There's an awful lot of historical reference in it, lots of references to all sorts of architects from the last 50 years. Um, he's using the, the power of computers to bring these colours together, bring these shapes together. Um, but he also professes a public purpose. This is a town hall. The theory behind this project is how can you make a public building 
sort of reconnect with citizens again. I'm looking forward to the conversation. I'm going to have with Pippa about, Pippa about this. So. <laughs> um, so what you are again seeing is, is this sort of real wish to make an impression on the world, to be a useful citizen, combined with very limited abilities to do so. Uh, this is another kind of architect. This is Field and Fowls. Um, it's a visitor centre for Yorkshire Sculpture Park, a place where you come and see modern sculpture, sitting in a sort of rural setting. And this is a less radical kind of architecture. Um, it's very good. It's very well considered. It's very thoughtful. It has a lot to do with... Um, what somewhat older architects in, in Britain have been doing for a while, a little bit like David Shifferfield, a little bit like Caruso Sinjan. Um, it's a very different kind of path. It's, it's, not, it's not trying to be more, more than what it is. It's saying, how can we do a really nice job of fulfilling this rather attractive brief in this nice place? But I wouldn't say that's fundamentally different from what an older generation of, of, of British architects have been doing for a while. There it is again, very thoughtful, very careful use of sort of very simple materials and so on. But then to come back to the kind of big issues, um, as I said, there is what everyone calls a housing crisis. It's, it's not a fiction, it's, it's real. The population of London in 1986 was 6.7 million. It's now 9 million. There are predictions it will go up to 10 and a half, 11 million. So you're talking about a 50% increase in the population of a city in, um, in let's say, 40 years, which, of course, compared to Chinese cities, it's, it's, not, it's nothing much. But for a mature European city, that's a big deal. At the same time, London has a, uh, has a green belt. Um, around it, which stops, which was basically a, rule, a law that is, prevents the city from expanding into the countryside. So the city can no longer expand horizontally as it did in the past. So you have to find ingenious ways to fit more people in the same area. It's a very big political issue. In this picture, we have Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, and we have uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, the leader of the opposition, who hopes to be prime minister quite soon. Um, and they are looking at Churchill Gardens Estate, which is a large public housing development that was designed in 1946, built over the following five years, um, in the middle of London, on the River Thames. And it was, for its time, a pioneering work of modern architecture, and it was designed by two architects, Sir Philip Powell and Hidalgo Moya, who were 29 at the time that they won the commission. I, don't know, I can't remember how many units it has, but many hundreds of people live there. And that's the same um, estate there. So, these 29-year architects, architects were given responsibility for all of that. Um, and it was in the time after the war, there had been bombing, there was a feeling that um, some, a new world had to be built, and that therefore young architects with new ideas should be brought in to design this new world. And then another sort of rediscovered hero, like Neve Brown, or heroine, uh, is this woman, Kate McIntosh, who um, is a little bit younger than Paula Moya. She's still alive. Um, she worked in the 1960s and 70s for the councils of Southwark and Lambeth in London, again, designing public housing. Um, and again, she designed a project like this uh, in her 20s 
This is not the most fantastic photo, I'm afraid, but it is a quite remarkable uh, building in South London, again, social housing. So people look at her, look at Neve Brown, and sort of think, well, we would like to do the same in some way. And they're trying. So I think Finn Williams came to speak here. Finn Williams has set up um, public practice, which is a scheme that gets young architects sort of embedded in local authority um, offices so that they can influence their planning processes, um, so they can influence their decisions regarding buildings. And the idea is to sort of bring back the, the dignity, the respect that used to be accorded to this kind of role, to working in, in, in the public sector. It's a pretty new programme. That's why I can only really show you pictures of people rather than projects, because there aren't really the projects to show you yet. But it's, uh, it's an intention, and I think it's, it's, it's a well-considered plan, at least. We'll just have to see how it turns out. Then we have the Oslo Architecture Triennale, which is opening round about now, um, with, uh, curated by, among others, um, Maria Smith and Finn Harper, who, did Maria speak here, or Finn did? Right. And they are taking the issue of um, climate, which everyone is obviously very concerned about. Um, they are taking the idea of degrowth, which is an economic and political idea that um, exist, originates outside architecture, but the idea that you cannot continue to grow economies forever at 3% a year, because that means you double uh, every 20 years, and if you continue that over centuries, then you have insane rates of rates of growth, which ultimately become unsustainable. So degrowth is asking the question, how can you um, apply that to architecture? What would degrowth architecture look like? Um, and again, it's not that easy to show you what it looks like, because it's not all there, and degrowth architecture is hard to represent. But this is a work of Maria Smith's practice in Terrabang. Um, which is not architects and um, engineering practice combined. And this is a market, a temporary market structure that's being built in Ilford on the edge of London that will open next year. And the idea here is to make it entirely out of elements that can be reused. Um, timber structure, um, the cladding, it uses gabions, uh, rough stones to stabilize it. It doesn't make any, uh, nothing is put into the ground, no concrete is poured into the ground. And the idea is you can keep reusing the components, which obviously in principle um, is better for the environment than using stuff and throwing it away again. But again, it's notable that something like the Oslo Triennial has got this sort of colossal global ambition, but the most sort of tangible manifestation of this thinking is in, in something that's sort of relatively small and, you know, it's a temporary market where you can buy nice things for a few months. It's not, it's not something that is really going to change the world. Uh, in the long term, it represents an aspiration, an idea, um, rather than really being an answer in itself. And then I'm going to come back to Assemble, who did Cinerolium. I mean, they have had a remarkable history, uh, Assemble, in sort of nine years. So they started as, as students, as people, 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds, when they did Cinerolium, made a name for themselves, um, 
there are a lot of them, there are 14 or 15 or so, who came together more or less by accident. It's a sort of group that could have dissolved, could have fallen apart quite easily, but um, somehow or other they, they haven't. Uh, they have become very popular for doing mostly sort of nice little things in public spaces, like Cinerolium, but um, sometimes commissioned by local authorities. They did get to do one sort of permanent project, which is um, a sort of grown-up project, if you like, uh, which is for Goldsmiths Art College, which is a conversion of an old building into a new art school and gallery. Um, but probably their most significant project is this one, which is called Granby Four Streets, and it's in Liverpool. It's in an area where it was government policy in the first decade of this century to basically clear away the houses. It was a very, very strange policy where they decided that the problem with housing in a city like Liverpool, unlike in London, was that it, was, it, was, it wasn't worth enough money. There was a kind of issue of supply and demand that actually there, was, there were too many houses for people to live in. That made housing very cheap, but it made, it made it so cheap that really no one would invest in renovating it. So the rather strange policy, which was a kind of application of economic policy to housing in a rather too literal way, was actually to demolish perfectly good houses. So you have fewer houses, so the law of supply and demand increases the value. Uh, they did build some new houses, but at a smaller rate than they demolished them. That created um, a sort of ghost street abandoned parts of the, of the town which were where they were waiting people were waiting to be emptied out or most of the streets had been emptied out and a few people were kind of hanging on of course quite often people fought this very vigorously people who lived in these streets didn't want to be moved out and that's what happened here so a particular corner of what used to be quite a central part of Liverpool it used to be very densely populated very active, vigorous place, and it became like a, a sort of desert almost. But the few people who were left uh, living there got together, they fought against being evicted, they succeeded, eventually they managed to put together a kind of social enterprise company to renovate the houses, and, that's, and they brought in a symbol to find very simple, low budget ways of renovating the houses. Um, which is what they did. So people continued to live there. There was a kind of strong community spirit in the street that was engendered through this whole process. And then one house, which was considered too ruined to be saved, assembled made into this winter garden here. So this is essentially a very ordinary, typical sort of workman's house um, where everything's been taken out a glass roof has been put on and it's been made into a conservatory which is a kind of space that everyone can share and people from outside can, can share. And it's very lovely, it's very successful, it's sort of constructionally intelligent, um, you know they're really, as you can see, it's very very basic form of building but they're making the most of it, they're doing the most that they can with with bits of wood and paint uh, and old bricks. So that's undoubtedly a success, it's undoubtedly housing, it's undoubtedly got a social purpose, it's undoubtedly uses design in an intelligent way, but it's really, really small. It's eight houses and it took them six years to do this. So again, there's a kind of question of scaling up. So, I'm not millennial, I'm a lot older than that. Um, when I arrived uh, at architecture school 40 years ago, next week, um, the climate then was modern architecture is a complete failure. 
um, artistically, constructionally, socially. We have to find another way of doing architecture. Architects should not be allowed near anything with a kind of social function. At best, architects might decorate an office building, sort of give it a different styling, or they might be asked to do a museum or a private villa where they can do a, a sort of artistic little essay in whatever architecture might be. Um, that in Britain was sort of simultaneous with Margaret Thatcher coming to power, a complete rejection of the idea of sort of public intervention either in culture or in something like housing. It wasn't really till the 90s that um, people really started to say, well, maybe an architect could be useful in designing housing or a, or a school or a hospital. Um, we went through the whole phase of st architects, iconic architecture that we're all familiar with, uh, which doesn't really go away, it's, it's still there. Um, but in this whole 40 years that I've been in the business, I haven't witnessed such an intense desire to sort of do good. Um, but as I say, it's, which is, I think is a very hopeful sign. I also think that um, political pressure might actually make a difference at some point. Uh, for example, in the, in the realm of housing, conservative right-wing politicians are now saying in Britain we should build more public housing with state money, which was unthinkable five years ago. So these things do change. I'd like to think that this kind of bubbling under of repressed energy will have a, a, a positive outcome or many positive outcomes. I'm, I'm kind of impressed by the ingenuity that's shown in some of the work that um, I've seen, but so there's this hopefulness, there's this energy, um, there's an intelligence, resourcefulness, uh, but there's something wrong with the kind of gears that might translate this sort of wonderful power into some beautiful uh, moving vehicle. So I'll leave it at that, but I really love to know what Pippo has to has to say or what you all have to say. First of all, I would like to thank Rowan. It was extremely clear, extremely. Also, I would say, I mean, it was reality. For it, it, so we, we can discuss this. But I also would like to know if anybody, I, I see millennials around here, so maybe they want to uh, say something about themselves. <laughs> the, and I also friends here that know architecture very well, that do architecture. And see, my, 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 Main point, which is a little more cynical, is uh, for me, I think architecture is a, con is a contextual discipline. No, I never believed to autonomy in my life. I think architecture is made of three parts. It's made of society, it's made of technology, it's made of art. And one, when one of these three parts take over on the others, architecture dies, no, basically. So I think uh, architects today engage which, with what it's on the table today. So it's not, it's not the architects who make politics, to put politics on the table. Architects react to politics because it's on the table. Uh, some of them do it with ingenuity, some they do it with honesty, some they do it as marketing, some, some they do it because they're cynical. I think this is not, this is not, it's not very different this generation than it was before, I think. I look, I, I see these things happening in 
transversely in all generations. I watch architects in all generations. So maybe UK is a specific context for certain things. Uh, I mean, it would be completely different to discuss public housing in Italy versus what it means to discuss public housing in the in, in, in UK. So I think there's a lot of beautiful topics, I think, that comes around, uh, around this. Yeah, I, mean, I think your description of the, the three factors, social, technological, artistic, is, is, is brilliant, is, is absolutely right. Um, and that's, you're certainly right, the architects are made by their situation, but I think the, the situation has changed so much that the architects are different. So maybe in the mid-90s, I was helping to select uh, Architects for a book called New Architects. You know, there are always these initiatives to promote new architects. Um, it's always a beautiful idea. The new architect, the young architect, what can they bring? Um, they're always sort of seen as slightly suppressed individuals who need help come to the surface, which is all fine. Um, but we went through these submissions of all these young architects, and really they were not young in spirit. Um, every single one said, we, we want to deliver what our clients ask for on time and on budget in a contemporary idiom with a sort of little bit extra of kind of artistry. But none of them were saying, we think the world should be like this. We think architecture should be like this which was completely different from, let's say, the 1970s generation, when you had people like Zaha Hadid and Ren Koolhaas and Daniel Lieberstein in the Architectural Association in London, or Leon Korea, who were all passionately conducting polemics about the meaning of architecture, seeing architecture as a hugely significant cultural activity, and arguing about it as if it was um, you know, the difference between communism and anarchism or something like that, almost like religious. Yeah. And it's different again from what we're seeing now, which is this, this intense desire to be sort of socially useful. At that particular moment in Britain, because there had been so little public patronage, because architects had been so conditioned to work for the market, that all they could really imagine was being a service provider, yeah. being, being a consultant, like a good, efficient, thoughtful, slightly artistic consultant. But that was it. Um, yeah. No, no, this is, this is, I think it, it, Italy is a different stage. I mean, I, I never heard in my life an Italian architect say, I'm working for my client. Never. I mean, there are witnesses here. They were always work, working for the public uh, domain. They were also working for the public space. They were, especially in the 80s, when London, I mean, early 80s London was so exciting, of course. Uh, we were, we became the enemies of society exactly because of the public housing we have built in the 70s and in the 60s. Yeah. So the architects would tell they were only designing public space, they were designing void, they were, they were taking care of the non-built part of the city, the open space, the public space, because they were scared by the topic of the, of the I mean, Alderosi <laughs> legacy, of the, of the Italian uh, enormous politicized uh, policy, you know, of, of public housing and, and welfare architecture from the 60s and 70s. Well, the common good. I think that, yeah. was, that wasn't the theme, the common good. No, no, just, it was just, uh, so that was all I was saying, that you were talking about the common good. No, no, I, would, I just wanted to say there is a different paradigm. I think there are different paradigms. Uh, and, and of course, uh, I mean, it, 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 a discussion on public housing today in Italy would be completely different from this, no? 
because we are houses in excess, we are buildings in excess. I think we could recycle a lot of buildings into houses. It's very hard to recycle house and house into something else. It's very easy to recycle anything into a house or into a series of houses. So I think that the means are many, are that different. That's actually an interesting this is This is what I'm extremely interested uh, in. Because, yeah. um, I mean, particularly in relation to climate change or climate emergency, as it's now called, um, you know, one of the things that people are now finally looking at is embodied energy, the energy that goes into a building when it is built and demolished, um, compared with energy in use. So architects for a long, long time, 30 or 40 years, have been quite concerned with energy in use, now zero carbon, how can you... Yeah. How can you use as little energy as possible in the heating and cooling and maintenance of a building? But they've been a bit less interested in the carbon emissions, the energy consumed, the resources consumed when you build a building. For an obvious reason, because um, building buildings is architects' business, so it's a little bit difficult for them to kind of contemplate uh, not building a building. And there's a whole. That's a whole value system that is built around new buildings that's, that's built into the way awards are um, given out, that's built into the education of architects. And of course, we'll still need to go on building buildings um, forever, but there is certainly a very compelling case for trying as hard as you possibly can to reuse existing buildings and to reuse them in an architectural way, not just find sort of convenient solutions, find a particular insulation or oh, so the way you can actually make something beautiful out of that. From and that's testimonial for the recycle, no? <laughs> but I have another question, a little more. Isn't it interesting that Assemble, which was probably the most interesting group in this they they had they became interesting architects after they got the Turner Prize. I mean, they had to be legitimized by the art world um, before getting to you no. Know? Well, I might say they were interesting before. No, no, of course they were. The Turner Prize was big. So, for for those who don't know, um, in Britain we have the Sterling Prize, which is the big prize for architects, I mean the Turner Prize, which is the big prize for artists, and Assemble won the Turner Prize um, for work they did related to that Liverpool project that I showed you. And I don't want to walk on a minute, they're not artists, they're architects, but that did, that did validate them yeah. um, in the public eye. And they, they were a bit, a bit nervous about it, and I think rightly so, because um, it, you know, it's a bit strange if you have to call this stuff art before you really respect it. But that's what happened. Did they not finish qualifying yet? I can't quite remember. I think they probably have, well, some of them have. Some of them aren't qualified yet, I don't think. Some of them. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know the state of and where they all are with their, their part three exams, but. Um, for sure, some of them aren't qualified now, but... No, but it's, it's an interesting story. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Leah? Of yeah. course. Uh, I, I, I was impressed for your last uh, observation. And uh, do you think London plan, the London plan will change? Uh, considering the, a different kind of uh, uh, social housing uh, standard that you are, you are looking for. I was impressed in July, I've seen the exhibition at the New London Architecture, and uh, in this exhibition there was described the history of social housing in England and particularly in London, mm -hmm. and there was a bit in which uh, um, the, the the exhibition tried to uh, say we need to change a bit how we build social housing in the in the in the city. This is the first question. And then the second one. Uh, this year is the uh, the 
Japan, the, uh, there was this the task force uh, book. Uh, do you think, looking back at two, 20 years ago, uh, uh, we can save something and uh, what we can save from this experience mm -hmm. and uh, what um, maybe we have to review also now. I know that the political context is completely different, but I, I believe, probably I'm wrong, that uh, in, uh, in this book there was fundamental aspect, important for not only for England but for the world. Yes. So. Um. Okay, so, so the first question is really about your housing now in London. And, and what is actually happening, which I didn't talk about because it's not being done by Millennium, is there is a certain amount of new public housing being built that's really good. It's not a sort of radical architecture, but it's just very intelligent, good quality. So you have architects like Alison Brooks, um, McCrenna Lavington, Derek Marsh Morgan, um, who are kind of heroes for me because, because it's, really, it's really tough to do this. You're under so many pressures from, from all sorts of directions. And there's been a bit of a shift in the way in which um, housing is commissioned, which is a bit technical, so I won't talk about that. But uh, there is something good happening in that respect. And if you compare it with uh, the, the work I showed you, the Paolo Moya housing or the Neve Brown housing, it is less architecturally adventurous, but it is more, it doesn't come with the kind of risks and the problems that those projects definitely had. And that should not be forgotten. So that's a sort of quite a good thing. Um, in terms of the Urban Task Force, I think, uh, so this was Richard Rogers. I was invited by Tony Blair when he was relatively new Prime Minister to, um, to propose a policy for cities to how to make cities better. And it essentially set out Richard Rogers' principles, which is that um, a compact city is a good thing. A city with high density, with good quality public spaces, um, where people use public transport, where they walk, where they use cars, where you have enough people living close to each other that supports shops and restaurants and buses and things. Uh, and, and in fact, the kind of ideal continental European city, which is in, in Rogers case very clear that he's looking at Barcelona, he's looking at Italian cities indeed, compared with the sort of sprawling Anglo-Saxon suburban city. Um, that had some effects, that policy. Um, it definitely made people take those issues more seriously. It it led to people taking design a bit more seriously, architecture a bit more seriously. Developers felt they had to at least pretend to take these issues seriously. Um, so I think it's mostly had a positive effect. Of course, like these things, it, it gets uh, dumbed down, it gets applied very cynically. So you had developers um, doing the kind of bare minimum to look as if they were um, doing what, what Richard Rogers talked about. And then this idea of kind of good architecture got debased very quickly, at least in some cases. So because, because good architecture is kind of a nebulous concept, um, you know, it's, quite, it's sort of a matter of opinion, or it seems as if it's a matter of opinion. It became, I mean, specifically in London, you had this situation where, for example, somebody wanted to build a really tall building, and then they said, well, you have to uh, have a good architect to build it. So they got Renzo Piano, good friend of Richard Rogers. Um, 
and that's Ricky, no? That's Ricky's time in London, no? That's Ricky Burdett's time in London. That, yes. and so, so you get a yeah. so you get, no, no, so you get, you get another Pritzker Prize winning architect to design yeah, yeah, yeah. the Shard, which we can talk about the architecture of that, but I think in sort of planning terms, that's sort of quite a problematic project. And it's not, in terms of the thinking about the city, that's a very flawed project but then but then after that you don't even have to get Renzo Piano you can get somebody else you can get Rafael Vignoli you can get you know somebody else who is kind of deemed to be a good architect I mean the, 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 all the all the propaganda carried by Rogers and Ricky 20 years ago was It was 20 years ago. 20 years ago was the competition among cities. So now it was the Bilbao time. So 20 years ago, this was about the effectiveness in the, in the economy, in the harmonizing the, uh, the economic growth of the city with the presence of good architecture. And I mean, it's a, a very generic idea of sustainability, no? Yeah. But it was not about social issues. It was not about, I mean, it was a completely different frame, I think. It was about growth, very much about growth. Well, it was an idea about the city and about sort of how, yeah, yeah, yeah. how, how people can sort of live together in the city. Um, but of course, and, and Rogers espoused density, and of course, developers love that. And suddenly yeah. say, it's good to be dense. The more the more you put on a site, the better it is. And um, so they grabbed that. And um, so, like I say, some of the ideas were put into practice, but it got watered down really fast. Because in Britain, property developers are really powerful, and the private sector is really powerful. And um, the and then you have these rather flimsy, kind of compromised institutions who try and direct them one way or another. Uh, but still, I think. There are places in London that were better than they would have been if there had been no urban task force. It would be nice to involve somebody in the discussion. Uh, in the meanwhile, I can say that Marina wants me to be more provocative, yeah. but I don't. Okay. But I, I can. I maybe I rem uh, recalling the Italian experience. I can say. I mean, from the 30s, you, we learned that you don't need to be a fascist architect to do fascist architecture. So the same, same you didn't need to be a, a leftist or social sensible architect to build social housing you know, in this country. So, so architecture is a very complex. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I have a question to ask you. In the 80s, the... Uh, Uh, well, I'm, I'm French uh, architect and PhD candidate, and I'm actually um, uh, uh, having a fellowship at the French school in Rome. So I met pe people this morning to talk about my research about Aldo Rossi, so I'm really glad to be here to today. And um, so in, in the 80s, the French critic, uh, François Chalin, maybe you know him, considered the return to drawing as a refuge in a situation of a crisis and disenchantment. Apart from the social and political uh, engagement of millennial architects, do you think there might be a possible refuge today? Uh, yes, I mean... I don't... <laughs> I mean, also Leon Creer and Aldo Rossi, to some extent, uh, shared an opinion. I mean, Leon Creer, for a while, said, you know, you have to draw because you couldn't build because uh, well, it's a long it's a social. Time. That was a long time ago, and then he discussed you because you could build, but um, in his own particular way. Uh, and then Daniel Lieberstein as well said you could only draw and. But, but don't you don't you think it's, just it's kind of interesting. I yeah. actually be, I don't have an answer. I'd be interested to know why that's no, but I can I can challenge you with an answer which is don't you think that today 
the refuge is uh, this kind of festival of Biennale, Triennale installations, uh, like Formula One circus of architects going around, uh, traveling to one, they're all the same people, no? Around all the Biennales and Triennales around the world. Isn't this place the role of drawing in the 70s? Yes, maybe. I mean, I'm not, I was just asking you about this. Um, I just right. saying, I mean, right now we have. Oslo Triennial, uh, Chicago, Seoul, yeah, Georgia, 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 Georgia. Um, there's probably some others which I've forgotten. And you know, especially when you talk about climate and, and these things are like circuses that yes. people fly. I mean, maybe I should only go to Sharjah if I can go on a, a ship, you know, or a camel or something. But, um, but yeah, I think they're a manifestation of a kind of frustrated energy, which doesn't mean they're all they're all worthless. I mean, I think the Oslo uh, Triennale is certainly started a debate by putting this quite um, relevant, extreme, or strong position. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's this idea that drawings are a refuge and. I mean, yes. it would be interesting if it came back. I mean, you also have someone like Grodsky in Russia yeah. at the same time. It could, it could work for different reasons. Um, and I'd actually like to, to see that as well. Well, yeah, quoted a very dangerous word in the beginning, which is utopia. No, Archi architectures yeah. do utopia when they don't want they don't want to do something. No, they they do they do utopia when they like drawings. I mean, <laughs> oh, that's the yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting that it's not happening that much. Um, what you're not seeing in the, in the work I showed, except maybe Adam Furman's, um, is kind of, it's a sort of high level of architecture. It's, a, it's a really pushing the, the boundaries of architectural artistry. You know, what, what I've shown, sorry? Yeah. No, no. What, what, what I've shown is, it's like, very good, intelligent, creative stuff. But there's nothing like what Zaha is doing or Lieberskind or all these people in the 80s. They're not people trying to kind of rip apart and reinvent and, and really create very, very kind of complicated uh, architectural universes anymore. That's just a completely different, a completely different kind of event. Yeah. Uh, just a, I have a very general question. Um, how do um, British millennial architects uh, relate or engage with the British Academia, with university? Do they teach? Do they uh, research? Or yeah, they tend to. They, they quite often have teaching jobs, which. Um, Kind of help them um, eat, <laughs> um, but not very much because they're very bad at paying. What they really want to do, what they really want to do is, uh, is to get a job in ETH, and then their lives are much better. Well, yeah, eventually when you graduate, you're kind of ETH level. Um, yes, they they do they do. Work in academia. Well, they survive. They survive, exactly. But I, it's hard to say, it's not like you can point to one school where there's a sort of real focus of energy or. Yeah, well, so yeah there's, I mean, there's stuff happening at AA, there's stuff happening at the house. Yeah, um, it is quite a sort of dispersed scene. It's not like everyone's going to the same cafe and arguing all night long. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ju just ask, I'm sorry, I'm Steve Miller, Director of the BSR. Um, uh, just a quick one. In terms of kind of the way in which construction and building have kind of evidenced themselves, and I'd be interested if you, if you actually commented on them or wrote about them. I'm sorry, I haven't followed you closely enough. Um, <laughs> are things that have come down 
So Grenville uh, Tower uh, was really, really revealing in terms of what it told us about the neighbourhood and what was happening in the built environment and occupancy and how things were being built or badly built or and also obviously the bridge in Genoa and the impact of these kind of infrastructural failures in a way within communities and within urban areas. Uh, and, uh, you know, for, for me, the, it's, it's the last kind of 18 months have been about things that have fallen down or gone up in smoke or just crashed to the ground uh, within 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 major cities and the impact that that has had on a kind of psychological level within an urban environment of a compacted urban environment and neighborhoods but also in a kind of logistical level in terms of its impact upon the city in terms of breaking supply chains um, and links into I guess to some of the issues around planning and the involvement in in, in the politics in a sense of yeah. building as well and I just wondered if you had any views on the kind of reaction within the profession and maybe how whether it's received differently by different generations or whether there's yeah. been any been any kind of discourse of, of kind of collapse or redundancy or if things are popping up but they're also falling down um, I think Grenfell I mean you have to be very careful when you say that message that people took from Grenfell was that it represented the sort of neglect of public housing, of it sort of not being respected, taken seriously enough. Um, there's a specific architectural issue, constructional issue, which is for quite a long time there's been a push to forms of approaches to construction that are kind of contractor-led, developer-led, uh, in which the architect is marginalised. And so essentially you, you say to the contractor, you know how to build, build a building, we trust you to build the building, you do it. The architect might give a bit of advice on the sidelines, but the contractor is the main decision maker. And part of the theory behind that is that you you take risk out or that the risk is carried by the contractor and not by the public. So it's become a kind of whole way of getting buildings built, which has marginalised architects. Um, and as I say, it was all in the name of taking risk out. The recladding of Grenfell Tower was conducted in that culture. So it was contractors making decisions about cladding. The there were architects involved. They didn't like what was happening, but they were overruled. And then you're supposed to have taken the risk out, but look, we have this catastrophe, so the most horrible kind of risk was actually there. Um, so of course the process didn't work. Uh, uh, and it's the biggest disaster in a fire in Britain for at least a hundred years, if not longer. Um, so as far as architects are concerned, um, the message was that we should really make that point that, that these processes are not doing what they're supposed to do. Um, so there's that combined with the let's take social housing more seriously. Um, and I think that the work of the architects that I was showing uh, is very much a response to this to this contractually risk-free forms of procurement because they're really trying to find ways to express themselves at a real margin. So part of an attraction of a pavilion is you can control the construction of it in a sort of traditional way. You can control the details, um, even though the details might be quite rudimentary because it's temporary. Whether, whether that will really change, I, I don't know, in terms of the procurement issues. Um, you have very powerful construction companies, very powerful development companies, who 
you know, they're not, it's not going to change easily. So I just don't know. But in terms of the public housing issue, I think you can't expect some movement over some of Um, I have a really simple question. Um, uh, it's basically um, mm, so the title is it that makes millennial architects so interesting, so appealing. Mm -hmm. and that we understood that it's basically their good intentions um, in rega with regards to society. Um, but I'm more interested in knowing if the architecture they produce is actually interesting in your room. Okay. That's, that's, that's a good old Walter Benjamin no, question. Does yeah. well, it show you some architecture that I think is good? Yeah, so it's yeah. yeah. If the one has a good intention, but then the outcome is very different. So, how do you actually evaluate and. Um, Walter Benjamin used to say the political value of a literary text is this literary value, no? <laughs> we used to do this. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that heterogeneity is a problem in itself. Uh, that certainly you can't, we're not in a time like modernism or even postmodernism, where there is a kind of dominant discourse that people can react to in terms of how you design buildings. Um, so, you, yes. This kind of work, you treat each one on its merits. You say this is good in this way, this is good in that way, this is less good in that way. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's a critique you can make of this kind of architecture that it's not, in terms of its architecturalness, it's not really changing the world, it's not really creating something new. I think we're definitely in that sort of time. So like I said, it's not like the 1970s when, when all these people at the AA sort of really inventing new ways of doing architecture. Does, does that? Well, oh, that's the point. I mean, don't, don't, just to add, I think this is a very big focus. If we take, I mean, if you take this very seriously, if you, if you take the, Eco issue, no, the ecologic issue, completely serious, 100% seriously. The degrowth issue is completely serious. So, I mean, do we really need architecture? I mean, is there any, any, why, 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 why do that? Why would they need us? No. But could you say this sense of social purpose, which you think I, I, it unites this generation, is creating a new conformity in people like Adam Foreman, who we invited, and we were criticized for inviting him with, on this program, that people said, you know, it's sort of a lone, a lone voice in, in the discourse, and people like him are being pushed a little bit to the side. Well, I think that's really wrong if that happens. I'd ask, it was, it's a question. Sorry, <laughs> it's a question more than an affirmation. So what's the question? My question is, do you, do, you, do you think that we're seeing a new conformity, a new conformity. which that's is to do with social purpose and it's conformism, that's thank that's you, that's and not to do with, with, us, that, with building in yeah. the way, or breaking um, new grounds, the way that Adam is, is trying yes. to do. Very to do so. yeah. And I think with this whole question, of architecture and social purpose, at any time whatsoever, you really have to ask what is specifically architectural about the issue and what can an architect contribute. So, you know, that's one of these questions is, should architects design airports? I think it's a lot. I don't know the answer, but you know, it's, not in the power, it's not in the power of architects to, to stop people flying. That's not an architectural yeah. question. So then the question is, an architect is asked to design an airport where well, you can make the airport more or less nice. And yeah, but then the question is, would democracy survive 
to uh, limiting the movement of people, for instance, and an idea. So, 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 so it's complicated now. It's always way beyond architecture at that point. But for example, if you take the problem of retrofitting buildings. Um, a building products manufacturer can invent products for making existing houses more thermally efficient, let's say. That's not really architecture. But an architect can conceive a way of retrofitting an existing building in such a way that people want to live there. Or the building can be sort of better used than it might be no, no, otherwise. I agree. Yeah. So architects are always in this kind of interface of um, kind of significance and, and impotence. Um, yeah, they, don't, they can't remake society. They can't even they can't remake the building industry. They can't remake um, the commissioning of buildings or the economic conditions under which buildings are. Uh, are brought into being, they can only do what they do with an awareness of these issues and to see where they might contribute with their particular kind of intelligence to these questions. Or that's one thing and the other thing, they can just be activists as well, they can be informed members of society who want to make a point. I have a big question for you. I have two questions. One is totally unserious. The other one is very simple. The one answer is the Peter Pan generation is my generation. <laughs> Don't even try to, to. We are the Peter Pan generation. I mean, my the, the, the baby boomers are the real. I mean, if I look into my daughter's life, we are the Peter Pan. Uh, the second question is, uh, in the last one and a half century, the focus of, I mean, the meeting point between Development, civilization, creativity, culture has been cities. No, these allow big achievements, but at the same time, we seeing now it's creating big problems. Do you still see the, the future? I mean, this is a discussion we were doing before. Do you still see the cities as the focus in the future? If we if we put energy in kind of sustainable uh, agriculture, if we put emphasis in another way of producing, uh, transporting, uh, shipping things from a place to another, do you still think we need the cities? I mean, because the question would be, if London is too expensive, why don't you go somewhere else? As I did in Italy. No, so, uh, so, so you think the city is the, still the future of the best crossroad for all the best production in the people's side? Of course. Graham Poole has just got this exhibition coming up. Well, I mean, this, we started 25 years ago, this discussion. We don't need Graham Poole as for this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but, so, so, so Graham Poole has just got this uh, show called Countryside Future of the World at the Guggenheim in New York next year. Um, where he's saying the issue is really about, not about cities, it's about countryside. And in fact, the urban problems that we talk about are a reflection of rural problems. Um, certainly, architects have a tendency to obsess about cities, because so that's sort of, yeah. that seems like what they should be talking about, because that's where architects are more kind of obviously useful. Um, but that can be excessive, and it's all particular architects are always obsessed with the middles of cities, which are actually not usually the most problematic parts, but they're, they're obsessed with more visible, uh, conspicuous parts. Um, I, I think cities are going to go on being important, and in many ways they are efficient in terms of transport and all those things. And of course there's an enormous investment of energy and resources in the fabric of cities that you don't want to throw away. Um, but I think a more fluid network thinking yeah. that looks at living outside cities as well. And the specific condition in Britain is that 
there's a kind of, although Britain is, or England is, is a really densely populated country, and although it's the first industrial country, um, we like to think of ourselves as rural. Uh, in fact, we're probably the least rural, large country, anyway, in Europe. But we like to think of ourselves as your rural. And so there's an amazing kind of cult of the countryside. And yeah. Protection of the countryside, some of which is really good and, you know, very impressive, some of the achievements of protecting the countryside. But um, that actually has also got a, got a stifling effect, which then bounces back on London and actually kind of increases the pressure on London to, to sort of house people and be, be in the centre of the country. So, in the British example, I, I would like to see a kind of more reciprocity between um, the city and, and, and the outside of the city. And in fact, the whole Brexit thing in Britain is quite a lot to do with London against the rest of the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I think this is important. C city culture in opposition to uh, sort of suburban and rural culture. Yeah, but this is a very 20th century scheme, no? It would be nice to... Uh, put some virus in this. Uh, You've been talking for an long time about yeah. technology. Enabled. Because this idea of the city is still the legacy of the idealistic German philos, no? Uh, manu Manufact versus nature in, in a radical. I think mixing up a little bit in this could be an interesting way to discuss in the future, or discuss the future. Anything else? Very good. Sebastian. Uh, I'm not so sure if I'm part of that, but <laughs> uh, I'm also a, maybe a millennial, I think, from my I'm from birth year, 87 is also millennial, no? Nin 19, okay. Um, I have a simple question, um, which is, where do you personally see the hope, let's say, for our generation? And because you were kind of mentioning these social housing ideas from the 70s as a kind of breakthrough moment for that uh, generation. But at the same time, you also explained we cannot kind of change the political or economic system. But you were also making a very interesting point about these architects when building their pavilions, they actually become their own contractors. So I wonder, do you see the hope rather still in the kind of left position or rather in a, in a market position maybe where we become rather more uh, economically engaged, maybe even entrepreneurial, which is something we... I mean, I hope for you as architects. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, globally, I think there's a lot of reasons not to be hopeful, but the reason to be hopeful is that people are more and more articulating kind of what is wrong with you know, the current state of affairs. Um, I mean, basically, I'm a liberal politically. I believe in the market. Um, I also, and essentially, I believe that people should be free to do what they want. Um, that includes uh, economic freedom. In other words, you're not going to be free if you can't eat. So, therefore, you don't just have a market. You need government to equalise inequalities and so on. Um, and therefore, I believe in a mixed economy. I believe in a mixed economy in architecture, which is a sort of very good thing, but this is what I think. Um, and, you know, I believe in private sector, public sector. Uh, I think in, in the world in general, and specifically in London, over the last 30 years, they have pushed the experiment of giving the decisions to the market to some kind of limit. Um, you know, so that the ideology since the early 80s has it's been, it's, it's the market that builds the city, it's private enterprise that builds the city with some kind of nudging and regulation. And we're kind of reaching a point where that's demonstrably not 
working very well anymore. So, in, so I think there is likely to be an adjustment, I think there is likely to be an adjustment of that kind. If you're a practicing architect, uh, you take your chances where you can um, with, a, with a conscience, you know, you, if you're really being asked to do something, it you find it's if you don't do it, you try trying to find what's useful and creative and what you can feel good about and what you possibly contribute to other people's lives. Um, and I think, uh, I guess if I was a, a millennial architect, I, I wouldn't be doing much different from what these people are doing, which is um, taking your chances and trying to make the most out of them and trying to find what is public in any situation. Does that, does that, does that have a problem? That's yeah, I think it's a great answer. I was just interesting that you pointed out this equivalence um, between the website and yeah. the state project. Maybe that is exactly this kind of asymmetry where you kind of try to fit in the market and earn money in a way, which uh, you have to, but at the same time you also try to be radical, but only in a safe space where uh, it kind of there's no risk. So yeah, I mean I think it answers uh, the question, but um, maybe to be more critical, I mean in a simple answer. Do you think architects should still engage in the regular way of finding clients, or should they maybe start building themselves? <laughs> well, I think That's everyone, interesting. <laughs> okay, I think everyone has to find their own, their own way. Like, everyone is always in a compromised situation. That's just life. Um, how you situate yourself in relation to a given compromised situation, defines who you are, um, the extent to which you resist, go along with it, try and cleverly reinterpret it. Um, I certainly like it when people are more radical, when people are less accepting of, their, of what they're given, what they're told. Um, so Simeonian was great because these were people saying we're in this very... Well, actually, the interesting thing about that was that they were actually sort of reacting against a situation that they themselves weren't quite in yet. In other words, they were students. They could quite easily have gone on being students, doing what students do, for a few more years, and then confront the issues of trying to get a job and things like that. So they sort of actually took an initiative um, that they didn't have to take. Um, what is that? Yes, I would, I'd, like, I'd like some people to kick a bit harder. I don't know if it's a short answer. You should study Pierluigi Nervi's experience. It was very good in being, very good in being his own employer. I, mean, I think this was Marina. We should all close. Just a quick answer to your question, um, which I think implies a condition of like being a voluntary prisoner of temporary architecture, which I, which I personally don't want to be. So like uh, I don't know. I I think it's a very um, huh? But, but no choice. Of, no, of course you have choice. But if. The, but you cannot make a living out of uh, temporary pavilions, like... No. no. It's simply impossible. Like, make a living out of the temporary Yeah, but then it becomes something... <laughs> that's, a, that's a different thing. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think if, if I were a millennial today, I would do whatever they let me do, basically. No? <laughs> Try to go to the ATH, like, uh, and uh, teach them. <laughs> no, I, I... Just to give you an idea, because this, of course, the discussion would move now 
to a, a crisis for the, for the profession because, for instance, in Italy, applications to architectural schools dropped 50% in two years. Oh. So it's not a minor issue. It's a very, very big and complicated issue. Uh, society, society, I mean, society don't even want to be a client. So, uh, so the discussion is very wide. In this, and maybe it's going to be another, another panel that Marina will organize for us in the future. Hello. Um, thank you for the talk. I kind of want to refer to a few points and go back to like the value of the architect and the point of the education system. And within England today, I think a lot of people are questioning whether the part three is relevant and maybe being more versatile and not pursuing the traditional route of the architect and qualifying as an architect and the question of not being an architect is valuable and maybe that rebellion brings out better results and makes our, the person who's capable of being an architect more accessible in lots of different areas and maybe architectural education should kind of pursue that more heavily or is there is there a positive in that kind of I think uh, I think architectural education should certainly allow more ways of being an architect than it tends to do um, I mean, sometimes I think architectural education is not so much about teaching people to be architects as teaching them not to be anything else. Yeah. Um, and and it, you know, the, 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 it's a ridiculous not the large number of different ways to be an architect. And people have usually different motivations. Some people really like the way the buildings go together and really happy working on that, maybe working for a big practice and you know, getting the details. But contextually, I think, want yeah. To change the world. Sorry. No, no, sorry. Um, contextually, I was just thinking economically, it's, it's even harder More to pursue. Just the student cost and the debt that you have to do to pursue that education where yeah, I mean, the I, result, it's almost, yeah. it's almost an gives you an... I mean, I had free education. They paid me to be taught. <laughs> Um, uh, well, um, yeah, because the architecture course is five years, so it's longer than other courses, so people leave with a huge debt and then they go into a badly paid profession. Yeah, that really sinks, basically. And it also means that um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't really recommend somebody from a poor background who's like the first of their generation to go to university, who's really struggled to get to university, if they said to me I want to study architecture, I would be very cautious about yeah. recommending that course, because they will have a huge debt, which they'll have a lot of difficulty paying off. Um, I, I, I don't think it would be a bad thing if there was more apprenticeship, if there was more opportunity to learn in a structured way in the profession. Um, yeah, if there were just ways of teaching that didn't involve any other debt of sixty thousand pounds or seventy thousand or whatever it is. Sorry. It's we, we need to close. I wasn't allowed to. Well, well he makes people committed or. Makes people more committed. Chambi kiri however. I mean, we can continue this conversation outside with a glass of wine, but now I have to declare this assembly prorogued, as you use in, in, in the UK, and, and close this. Yeah, I will thank the, the, the British School, Queen Marina, Rowan, and everybody here. Thank you for the great discussion. Grazie.